In an earlier History of Writing episode, I mentioned the monks who, through their tireless recreation of older manuscripts, helped preserve Roman and thus Etruscan civilization following Rome's collapse. One thing I skipped over there, though, was another contribution, the expanded use of cursive and the introduction of calligraphy into Western culture. Much to the bane of many a student's crimped, aching hand, I'm sure. But cursive and calligraphy weren't new ideas. In fact, cursive had been used by the general Roman population for centuries. And both that and calligraphy had been adopted as forms of writing in other cultures around the world for even longer than that. And while neither may seem as popular today outside of overly priced wedding invitations, maybe you're just not looking in the right place. Maybe cursive and calligraphy have merely transformed, evolved. Welcome to the History of Writing. Following the introduction of the written alphabet, Romans used a variety of scripts. The ones that most are familiar with, because you can find them pretty much anywhere, are square or book capitals, which were used for inscriptions on public monuments and for uh, early book production. But the more common scripts were Old and New Roman Cursive, which were used for all manner of daily writing, from merchants writing down uh, their, their business accounts to children learning the Latin alphabet, and rustic capitals, which were used for copying later pieces of literature. The Old Roman Cursive, also called Majuscule and Capitalist Cursive, is thought to have been used widely from about the 1st century BCE to about the 3rd century AD, though it could still be found in some legal documents in the 4th century, when in about 367, a legal decree came out and said that you could no longer use it, the general population could no longer use it, it was set aside specifically for uh, official imperial chancery use. Interestingly, at this point, it was considered sort of hard to read, and what this act did was, one, it legitimized the cursive and kind of made it so that this was the hand of business, the hand of the government, and it made it so, one, it legitimized those documents, and two, it kind of made them harder to forge. The new Roman cursive, meanwhile, also known as minuscule or later cursive, very original there, lasted from then to about the 10th century AD and really greatly influenced the development of the uncial script, which we're going to talk about more in a couple of minutes because it's extremely important. First though, rustic capitals, which are kind of easier to read than either of those cursive and sort of resemble the square capitals that we mentioned earlier, but which were often written in what's called scriptio continua, that is, continuous script, with no spacing between the words, though early examples had what are called interpunks, or dots used to separate words. Worth noting, however, it was apparently a status symbol to have an educated slave who could read the script without the interpunks. Go figure. Back to uncials, though. These were based on a form of handwriting out of Greece used particularly for writing on papyrus that was more slanted with at least partly connected letters. This then migrated over to Rome, where it was given the uncial name. And uncia, uncia, however you want to say it, I'm probably pronouncing it wrong, being a Roman inch, which is exactly how high these letters were. At least at the beginning, because eventually they were far from uniform, and there are even very different versions of the script, including the half uncial, which was even easier and faster to write. But one thing I haven't mentioned about the uncials but which you might have already guessed. They're the progenitor of modern Western calligraphy. Before we go into all that, though, we need to talk cursive and calligraphy from around the world, because like many other aspects of civilization, Western civilization was a wee bit slow on the uptick. But what is calligraphy anyways? While you might just think it's beautiful handwriting. There's actually a bit more to it. It's a bit more nuanced, a bit more complex. It's not just beautiful handwriting. It's 
an art form. It's all about forming these written symbols by hand. So yes, it's a form of handwriting and arranging them, positioning them for aesthetic, rhythmic, and harmonious purposes, or perhaps more religious purposes, such as in China, where calligraphy or shufa, literally the method or law of writing, can be traced all the way back to those divination bones we talked about in a previous episode. This may also be where the brush was introduced as the primary calligrapher tool. Um, the most important tool, really, because the, the shape, the size, the type of hair, all of it influences the final product, as do the color and density of the ink, as well as the, the paper's water absorption speed and surface texture. There's really a lot to consider when you really think about it. There's a lot of different aspects of calligraphy that you kind of don't think of at first. Japanese and Korean calligraphy, or shodo, the way or principle of writing, and seoi, the art of writing respectively, were heavily influenced by the Chinese forms, though each developed its own kind of styles and techniques. The same could be said of Mongolian and Vietnamese calligraphy, and possibly Tibetan calligraphy, though that is more derived from uh, Indic script and is rather central to the culture as nearly all high religious communications were written or include at, le at the very least included some calligraphy, including letters sent by the Dalai Lama. Things are similar in Thailand where calligraphy is primarily written in Sanskrit and historically limited to sacred texts of the Pali Canon. I mentioned Indic there, and so in India, calligraphy could be found on smoke-treated palm leaves bound together with string or even on birch bark. In the Philippines, many ancient indigenous scripts, collectively known as Suyat scripts, were lost thanks to Spanish colonization, though artists have been attempting to revive them. Ethiopian calligraphy began with the Ge'ez script, also called Fidal, meaning script or alphabet, and dates back to the 5th century BCE. Islamic calligraphy, also known as Kat Uliyan, evolved alongside Islam and the Arabic language, and is based on Arabic letters. It is also closely associated with the absolutely gorgeous Arabesque art style, in which, to this day, proverbs and passages from the Quran are still being expressed. And we shouldn't forget the other side of the world, where Mayan calligraphy utilized the Mayan hieroglyphs, though today, modern calligraphy in Mayan languages is generally written in Latin script. But back in Europe, as the monks used the then somewhat freestyle uncial script to reproduce these manuscripts, they started getting a little fancy with it. Um, became somewhat less, it became somewhat less important simply to copy, reproduce a manuscript as it was to offer something of beauty, something of art. Remember, at this time, books were limited. There were just not very many of them, and literacy was still pretty limited. So each of these books was inherently special, and they started showcasing that within the text itself. These books started becoming just plain works of art collector's items, basically. They started becoming illuminated manuscripts, which, as you might expect, are texts supplemented with miniature illustrations and, yes, decorative text, aka calligraphy. And slowly that kind of freestyle handwriting, the, the kind of freestyle art form, transitioned into something more uniform, more uniform writing style, such as the Caroline or Carolingian minuscule, which later evolved into the Gothic script, also known as black letter. The Italican, also known as Chancery Cursive, and Roman Bookhand developed over the next few centuries as well, and the three of these each influence modern book types. In fact, when Johann Gutenberg developed his first printing press, it was the Gothic style that was the first typeface. We'll talk more about typefaces and Gutenberg's printing press in future episodes, but it's impossible to avoid here because after printing became rather ubiquitous, cursive and calligraphy suffered quite a bit. I mean, it was just faster, easier, and cheaper to print something rather than write it. However, that wasn't the end, obviously, of either form. Secretary hand, a cursive handwriting style, 
was widely used in England for both personal correspondence and official documents in about the 16th century, and cursive began to take on its more modern form around the 17th century or so. But there weren't really any hard, fast rules. I mean, it wasn't standardized. You could see this in some pretty famous examples, actually, such as Thomas Jefferson's draft of the Declaration of Independence, where most, but not all, the letters are joined, and you compare that to the fully joined rewrite by Timothy Matlack a few days later, you can see that there are quite some differences. In the 18th and 19th century, before the typewriter and when the quill, the easily broken quill, was the tool of choice, professionals also used a type of cursive called fairhand, as in it looked good enough for their correspondence, and children were being taught this and other forms of cursive in school primarily around the second or third grade, but that sort of varied. But as you know, cursive took another hit in the form of technology. First through the ballpoint pen, which helped keep ink from smudging, allowing for faster writing. Then, as I mentioned, of course, the typewriter. And then, later on, the phone and, eventually, the computer. And while I was taught cursive in grammar school and sort of dabbled in calligraphy, both have been scaled back because they're seen as generally not necessary, so much so that the Common Core state standards did not include cursive as a requirement. In many areas, in fact, it's being replaced with typing, though in many states cursive has been reintroduced and even mandated. As my wife would say, how would you know how to write your signature if you don't know cursive? There are some possible uh, cognitive benefits from being able to write in cursive as well. Um, there have been a few studies I've seen that have linked uh, better uh, cognition to writing your notes in cursive compared to writing them even in print or typing up the notes as it were. And sometimes, you know, it's, it's just easier to grab a pen and scribble down a note, especially in cursive. Though even the Notes app in my iPhone uh, seems to be killing that. Call calligraphy also underwent something of a reintroduction into society. As toward the end of the 19th century, Edward Johnston, a, a British craftsman, after studying a variety of published manuscripts, notably the works of architect William Harrison Callishaw, and Edward F. Strange, as well as the archives of the British Museum, began teaching a calligraphy course at the Central School of Arts and Crafts in London. He's actually been credited with completely reviving the art of penmanship and lettering through his, his teachings and his books. He also devised the round calligraphic handwriting style known as the foundational hand, and of course influenced an entire generation of typographers. Now, there's a lot more to the history of cursive and calligraphy. Many names, tools, types, countries, and more I've left out of this video simply to give it something of a narrative through line without ta talking and droning on for half an hour or more. I want to keep it relatively short. I highly, highly encourage you though, if you have an interest beyond this more high-level overview to check out the links in the description for more in-depth looks and analyses. But I want to leave you with this one thing. If you think cursive and calligraphy are dead, have you ever taken a hard look at the graffiti around town? Tried to read it? Could it be that cursive, calligraphy, while nearly dying out in the professional realm, have slowly, craftily evolved on the street level into this rather unique artistic style. I mean, I don't think it's that far of a fetch, especially given simply deciphering graffiti is really its very own discipline. I, there are some large parts of graffiti I can't read in the least. Others look at it and like, yeah, of course I know how to read that. Worth a food for thought, and I think we'll probably talk about graffiti in a future episode as well. But this has been Drunk on Writing's History of Print, Cursive, and Calligraphy. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to subscribe to the channel. Please give it a thumbs up. Please leave a comment below. Uh, if you have further thoughts, comments, suggestions about print or calligraphy or cursive, 
please leave those below as well. I'd love to hear your feedback. And uh, if you would like more from Drunk on Running, be sure to head on over to drunkonrunning.com where just a buck gets you far more videos far more often. Until next time, cheers and keep on riding.